Cells in reality, consciousness as a process in the fine scale structure of the universe. I've been interested in the problem of consciousness for a very long time, as I'm sure many of you have. Let's talk about reality first. What is reality? A lot of ways to approach this problem. Um, reality appears to be divided into two realms, uh, the quantum and the classical. Uh, the classical world is what we exist in. Everything's in definite places. However, the quantum world, things are different. Uh, it's governed by differing laws of physics. In the quantum world, generally small, but not necessarily, um, things can be in quantum superposition of multiple coexisting possibilities. They're not in any one place. Things can be separated over space and time, non-locality, non non-local entanglement, for example. Particles can act wave-like, more like waves than particles. And they tend to be small, although the, the size cutoff is, uh, can, can vary. That's, that's not the critical point. We don't really know what the critical transition is. That's, that's the problem. The classical world, things are in one place. They're localized. They're particle-like. They tend to be large, although not always. Now, for example, in quantum superposition, a particle, this happens to be a cesium atom in the yellow in front of us, can exist as a wave of multiple possibilities, as you see in the background, the blue and the red. Uh, or it can be, act as a particle. And uh, the problem is that uh, the particle is in a definite state and location. Um, the world we consciously perceive is exclusively made of particles, not waves of superposition. We tend to see things as definite and in one particular place. Except on psychedelics, by the way, where things can be wave-like, uh, I'm told. And, uh, <laughs> Not necessarily always in, the one, in one place. And, but I think actually that's a, that's a clue to consciousness and how psychedelics work and the boundary, the border between the quantum and the classical. Now, in the early days of quantum mechanics, experiments seemed to show that superposition persists only until being measured or consciously observed. Niels Bohr and others knew that their results were multiple coexisting possibilities, but when they measured and looked at the results, they got one result. And Bohr and others came up with the idea that measurement, or specifically conscious observation, caused collapse of the wave function, collapsed the wave function to definite states. This was a pragmatic solution. It allowed Bohr and others to continue to do their, their research without w worrying about the underlying reality. Einstein uh, didn't like that. He wanted to know what was really going on down there. Bohr didn't care. Shut up and calculate. Just make an assumption that, that observation causes the collapse and move on. And it's led to a lot of great things in quantum mechanics. Um, and uh, it's also called the Copenhagen interpretation or the conscious observer effect after uh, Niels Bohr's Danish origin. Now, Schrodinger uh, thought that uh, this idea was absurd. And he described his thought experiment of a cat's fate tied to a quantum superposition. And the idea was that uh, on, the right, uh, uh, on the right side, you see a quantum like a, a photon passing through a half-silvered mirror. It will both go through the mirror and be reflected. If it's reflected, it will, this is Schrodinger's thought experiment, Schrodinger's cat, it will enter this box, uh, trigger a poison to kill the cat. Because it's a quantum superposition on the outside, it both go, goes through and is reflected. Therefore, according to the Copenhagen interpretation, the cat would be both dead and alive until somebody looked at the cat, and only at that instant would it be either dead or alive. So again, the cat would be both dead and alive until observed by a conscious entity. And there's our conscious entity uh, in a brain on the outside, and he or she is looking and uh, sees the cat as dead. And the uh, live cat is gone. Bing. And Bing is meant to imply conscious experience, having a conscious moment. That's what we want to explain. Our brains are more than just machines. We have feelings, emotions, uh, free will, and so forth. We just don't know how. So Bing is meant to mean conscious experience. Or uh, he or she could see the cat as alive, getting rid of the dead cat, and having an experience of a dead cat, of, a, of an alive cat in this, in this situation. But this is dualist, right? It puts consciousness outside science. This is science and non-duality. We want a scientific explanation. So this is a pragmatic solution, but it kind of puts consciousness out in the Netherlands. We don't really know what it is, and it's dualism. And some people are happy with dualism. Um, 
So let's get rid of the observer as a way to cause collapse because it, it doesn't explain consciousness and that's what we want. And besides, this is the science of non-duality, not duality. But if consciousness doesn't cause collapse, what does? Well, maybe there is no collapse. Maybe each possibility generates its own universe. This is the multiple worlds hypothesis. So every time there's a, a multiple possibility, each possibility evolves and, and forms its own world and we have this infinite number, number of overlapping worlds. And this is a very popular uh, belief among physicists and others, but it's untestable, and in my opinion, silly, because it's, it's coming up with some fanciful explanation to get around a problem that we don't yet understand. Now, it could be true, but to assume it's true because we don't yet understand collapse, I think is a mistake. So I think it's kind of silly. There's also bone pilot waves where we have this other layer of, of activity that's guiding the, the activity of a particle and causing it to occupy, uh, become one state or the other, and that's a possibility. And there's also decoherence. This was bandied about as, as a solution to the measurement uh, to, to uh, quantum superpositions put forth by Zurich and Tegmark and many others. The idea there is that microscopic quantum states interact with macroscopic classical states. They meet the environment and this degrades and decays the quantum state. The problem with that is that at microscopic levels, everything is quantum, and decoherence actually involves spreading or extension of quantum states. So the quantum state just grows. There was just an, an article in The Atlantic, uh, an excerpt from a book by Philip Ball, who claims that the quantum state just grows, and somehow we're fooled into thinking it's collapsing. So this doesn't really explain the loss of superposition. It's, it's a fallback position. Or is there an objective threshold for collapse, quantum state reduction? Objective reduction, or OR. Uh, Gerard de Remini and Weber had an idea that a certain number of particles in superposition would self-collapse, but that didn't quite work out. What objective threshold would cause superpositions to collapse or reduce? But first, let's ask a question. What is superposition? How can things actually be in multiple states or locations at the same time? It's, it's illogical, it doesn't, it doesn't fit with our, uh, our classical world, but of course that's the problem. But how can that happen? Well, I, I work with Sir Roger Penrose, I think Chris is going to have a conversation with him later this evening, we're all looking forward to that. And he tried to solve this problem by relying on Einstein's general relativity, and just connecting general relativity and quantum physics is a feat in and of, in and of itself, because it's, it's still a mystery. But general relativity had shown matter was equivalent to curvature in fundamental space-time geometry. So the nothingness out there below the level of atoms all the way down to the Planck scale is actually made of something, space-time geometry. Now what that is, we don't know. Some people say strings, that's unlikely. Quantum gravity, quantum foam, space-time metric. There are a lot of names for it, but we don't, uh, spin networks, we don't really know. But at the bottom level, the Planck scale, there's information. But it curves. And of course, um, Einstein realized that uh, light from a star behind the sun would be bent by the mass of the sun causing space-time curvature. And he predicted that stars behind the sun would be visible if you could see them uh, because of the curvature of space-time. And Sir Arthur Eddington in 1919 went to a mountaintop uh, during an eclipse and sure enough saw a shift of curvature of, of uh, the stars behind the sun. And uh, uh, this was very consistent with Einstein's prediction, showing that space-time curvature and mass were equivalent, more or less. And here are Einstein and uh, Eddington uh, celebrating their Nobel Prizes. Einstein had it earlier for other stuff, and then Eddington got it for proving Einstein's theory of general relativity. But what about matter and, and space-time curvature at very tiny scales? What about space-time curvature part of quantum particles? Now, Roger Penrose came up with this idea in his book, uh, uh, The Emperor's New Mind, in 1989. And he started by, uh, to make it simple to draw something, uh, three-dimensional or four-dimensional space-time in two dimensionals, in these space-time sheets. So three dimensions of space uh, along what would be the x-axis, sort of, are condensed to one, and time along the other axis. So um, a particle, as we see here, is a curvature in this two-dimensional space-time sheet. And if the particle moves as it does in the bottom, the, cur the curvature moves. So you can think of this as representing an oscillation of a particle between two different locations, purely classical. Now, what about superposition? 
Roger realized that if this were the case, that superpositions were actually separations in fundamental space-time geometry. You had a curvature over here and a curvature over there, and the particles, as you can see on the right, are in two different places at the same time. So this was an approach to explain quantum superposition using general relativity, which, as I said, is a unique trick in and of itself because the two, general relativity and quantum mechanics, have been ir irreconcilable for all these years. And this is at least a conceptual approach. So here's the idea again. On the right, you see the quantum superposition of, space of separated space-time curvatures with the particle in two locations at the same time. Now, you might imagine that if this separation were to continue, we'd have multiple worlds. One curvature would go off and form its own universe with its particle. One, universe, uh, one uh, curvature would form another. And each would evolve its own universe. And we'd have the multiple worlds. But Roger Penrose suggested that these superpositions and separations in space-time geometry are unstable. And they will self-collapse or undergo objective reduction due to an objective threshold at a time t given by a very simple equation, basically a form of the indeterminacy or uncertainty principle, where the time t is h bar over e sub g, where e is the gravitational energy of separating the space-time from itself, or the mass from itself. And, and here was the kicker, along with a moment of conscious experience. Now, this came from a long argument through Gödel's theorem that I won't go into. But it turns the Copenhagen conscious observer approach 180 degrees, upside down. Instead of consciousness causing collapse, collapse causes consciousness. So this was an amazing uh, uh, and, and quite courageous proposal. He was, it was a big slap in the face to AI, who was saying that uh, consciousness is a computation. It, it tied together general relativity and quantum mechanics. And it was a hypothesis for a mechanism, an actual specific mechanism for consciousness. And 20, 28 years later, it's still the only mechanism that has been put forth for consciousness. We heard about Tononi's uh, uh, five, but that's kind of a correlation. Emergence, a lot of hand-waving stuff. But really, this is the only specific mechanism that's ever been proposed, this objective reduction. So here it is again. The uh, curvature, the separated curvatures evolve, and that at time t, one of them ceases to exist. The other one is selected. And bing, a moment of consciousness happens. Now, this would be occurring everywhere, like decoherence, in the random environment, in the, in the floor, in the chairs, in the clicker, in the uh, tables, uh, but randomly. And these events would be essentially what we would term decoherence. I don't think decoherence actually exists. I think objective reduction, you'll pardon the expression, trumps uh, decoherence and uh, replaces it, probably a better, even a better term. Uh, and so there is no such thing as de decoherence. So decoherence would, would spread, but it would reach this threshold and self-collapse. So these would be proto-conscious, or like Whitehead's simple occasions of experience. And metaphorically, they would be like the notes, tones, and sound of an orchestra warming up, each uh, musician playing his or her uh, instrument. It's a cacophony. It's noise. What we need for consciousness that we have, the kind of consciousness we have, is something to orchestrate this noise into something more like music. How could they be organized or orchestrated in the brain, for example, for full, rich, conscious experience? Roger needed a quantum computer in the brain which could orchestrate quantum information, halt or terminate by this objective reduction connecting to space-time geometry, and be influenced by non-computable platonic values. This was another uh, feature he, he added which is kind of like following the way of the Tao or divine guidance or something along those lines, uh, as well as reaching qualia, awareness or feelings, and would be in a position to regulate functional neuronal and synaptic activities. I suggested to him microtubules. At that point, I had been studying microtubules for 20 years. To make a long story short, we hooked up. Here we are at the Grand Canyon after the first Tucson conference, and we developed a theory uh, based on microtubules. And here's a picture of a neuron uh, inside of which are microtubules. And Chris showed a slide of a cell as kind of a minestrone soup of things floating around. That's not how cells are. They have an ordered structure due to the microtubules, which seem to process information. And on the left, you see a microtubule, which is a cylindrical lattice of proteins called tubulin. And microtubules do a lot of things. They, they guide motor proteins and synaptic plasticity uh, due to the placement of tau proteins. And when they disassemble and the tau falls off, 
we get Alzheimer's disease. So microtubules can process information. I spent a lot of uh, time modeling information processing in microtubules and then later quantum computing in microtubules with Roger. For example, we calculated that the E sub G of 10 to the 16th superposition in tangled tubulins, about 1 10,000th of the brain, would reach threshold in about uh, a 10 millionth of a second, uh, 10 million times per second for a conscious moment. So not just one microtubule, but many entangled throughout the brain. And basically, the idea is that, there, that this can happen at different frequencies, and moving from left to right, we're going faster and smaller into, inside the cell, into the microtubules, into the quantum realm. And at the, on the far right, you see that this is where anesthetics work. We had a paper in Nature Scientific Reports last year showing that anesthesia uh, dampens quantum vibrations in microtubules to selectively erase consciousness. There's evidence for, for this from uh, the work of Anurban Bandyapade showing experimentally quantum vibrations in microtubules in terahertz, gigahertz, megahertz, kilohertz, and hertz. So there's experimental evidence for this, for quantum vibrations in microtubules. So the basic idea is that there's a threshold is reached, there's a bing moment in the microtubules in the brain uh, connected to fine scale structure of space-time geometry, as you see at the bottom. So that other bing should be on the far right. And consciousness is a sequence of bing moments. It appears continuous, like a film or a video appears continuous, but it's actually a sequence of discrete frames or events. And here's that sort of the hierarchical multi-scale uh, uh, scheme again, from the cortex down into the individual quantum events. And if we go to the right uh, further, faster, we're going to get into the structure of space-time geometry and may not even need biology anymore. Uh, that the, the, in, the information in consciousness is occurring at this level of fundamental space-time geometry, which goes all the way down to the Planck scale, which you see on the right where there's information and patterns and so forth. And it could be that consciousness extends into uh, the structure of the universe at a deeper level. Bing, 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 bing. Kind of like astral projection in, in Vedic philosophies and so forth. Or in Eastern philosophy where bing is everywhere and the self would be a, a mega bing, you might say. Uh, Atman for Brahman or something like that. Or consciousness leaving the body at the time of death. When the blood stops flowing, the, the oxygen stops being delivered to the microtubules the, uh, and other structures, the quantum information uh, doesn't dissipate but uh, can uh, leak out but remain entangled as something like a quantum soul. I'm not suggesting any evidence for this. Many people have. I just think there's a scientific explanation for it. If it does occur, which I hope it does and I think it does, uh, and certainly, we, uh, scientists can't exclude it uh, outside of the brain, consciousness outside of the brain, until we've proven or know what consciousness uh, is inside the brain. Now, a couple things about uh, scale in the universe. Uh, if, if this is a log scale going uh, from left to right, from large to very small. The far right, we have the Planck scale. On the far left, we have the, the whole universe. And consciousness, or biology, at, at the microtubule level, for example, is almost smack in the middle of this. Uh, from a, on a log scale, which means it can have leverage in both directions or be influenced in both directions. I, I think this is kind of interesting. Raises the question in the universe, when did consciousness arise? Was it fairly recently with tools and language, earlier with animal cells, earlier with all life, or before the universe began? Now, <clears throat> most people would say that the universe began at the Big Bang. Uh, Roger, who is, uh, 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 likes to buck uh, conventional wisdom, uh, wrote this, uh, this book, The Cycles of Time, where he suggested that rather than the Big Bang being the beginning, it was actually uh, preceded by another eon, which in turn was preceded by another eon through something called conformal rescaling. And there's now evidence for this in concentric rings in the cosmic microwave background, which appear to uh, represent uh, giant uh, black hole uh, collisions in the previous eon that form these concentric rings and can be seen now in the cosmic microwave background. There's been some initial evidence and more and more evidence is coming from that. So it's kind of interesting. Raises the final point, the finely tuned universe is the concept that the values of fundamental physical constants are precisely what are needed for life and consciousness to occur. The anthropic principle encompasses explanations for this finely tuned universe. If things weren't exactly the way they are, we wouldn't be here. Why is that? Well, the things that have to be right are called these dimensionless fundamental physical constants, and I won't go through them, but there are 22 numbers, and if they weren't exactly what they are, we wouldn't have stars, 
with light, we wouldn't have life and we wouldn't have consciousness. So how did we get so lucky? This is the anthropic principle question. And there's two types of answers. The weak anthropic principle uh, suggests we won the cosmic lottery. We exist in the one and only universe of an infinite number of parallel universes able to support consciousness. Selection bias. We are the only ones able to ask the question. So there's the multiple worlds, and only one of them supports consciousness. We won the lottery. The other possibility is the strong anthropic principle uh, suggests that life and consciousness play some intrinsic role in the nature of the universe by influencing these constants which are somehow embedded in space-time geometry. How could that happen? One view is God. People say God started the universe, perhaps. The other possibility is that these fundamental constants mutate and evolve with each eon transition, from eon to eon, with each big bang to the next, tuning and driving the universe. The universe itself is actually evolving and mutating from eon to eon, like a rebirth of a human, uh, reincarnating, you might say. And consciousness could be the optimizing factor. So was, presumably there was consciousness in the previous eons, as we see on the right, and perhaps with each transition, the, uh, the properties, the fundamental constants are being tuned to optimize consciousness in the next eon. So over eons and eons, the universe is evolving to optimize conditions for us to be conscious. So if we make it through this eon, the next one will be even better, hopefully. So let me conclude by saying that Consciousness consists of self-organized rearrangements, ripples, if you will, in the fine-scale structure of the universe. We're actually tied to the universe itself, um, amplified through quantum vibrations in the microtubules and other structures in our brains. These ripples, each a wave function collapse due to Penrose objective reduction, are orchestrated and connected to the brain by quantum vibrations in microtubules. And I think consciousness is more like music than a computation and uh, self-organizing music. You don't necessarily need a conductor, but some more like jazz or improv or something like that. Three, consciousness may be guiding evolution of the universe over eons. As I said, the universe itself is reincarnating from eon to eon. And finally, uh, I didn't talk about this, but microtubule vibrations, if they're responsible for consciousness, uh, are a viable target for treatment of mental and cognitive disorders. Now, we know microtubules have vibrations in megahertz, and uh, in 2013, we published the first study showing ultrasound into the brain improved mood in normal vi volunteers. I was the first guinea pig. I can tell you it does work. We've since shown improved mood, and others have shown uh, improvement in Alzheimer's symptoms and pathology and brain trauma in animals. So I'll end there, and thank you very much for your attention. Thank you.